All right, hi guys, and um, we're doing comply with infection uh, prevention today. So, um, as Jackie Lowe was asking earlier, whether this is specifically about the COVID-19 or coronavirus, it's not. It's a unit that has um, been written, like, I don't know, a few years ago already. I haven't got it in front of me now to see the data in this edition. Um, but it's definitely um, the general knowledge that we all needed and that I did in the 80s in the hospital already. So it's no, there's no new information about it. Um, uh, you know, just because of the times being what it is now. But um, yeah, so uh, obviously it would, you know, include the COVID um, and cover the COVID-19 issue through the unit. Um, so in HK, it is something that is high on our radar because we are working with people that are vulnerable and, you know, uh, obviously we have to take extra care. Um, then what, uh, you know, yes, if you work in the medial, medical industry, whether you work in the hospital, whether you work in, with disability, you ha still have the same attitude, you know, you still would care for the people around you and care for yourself because of um, the environment that we are working in. Obviously, there are busy people and, you know. So, um, in complying with uh, infection control, I have um, gone back to the government um, um, structure for the force. So, the unit that you have, the learning guide, is not entirely set up the, the way that the government um, the actual unit of competency set up on training.gov. It is set up, some of our units is very clear about the same setup, but this one hasn't been updated to that standard. So I've just gone according to the government's um, uh, regulations for this unit, and it doesn't really match up to your book. So it's going to, there be one of, once or twice that I might refer to a page where you can see more information about it. Otherwise, it's a little bit all over the place in the book. It's not um, in the same um, structure. So in chapter one, um, it's all about following standards uh, and additional precautions for infection prevention and control. And um, so just want to go back to the previous slide. I don't think it's, um, so chapter 1.1 is following hand hygiene. Uh, chapter 1.2 is implementing um, hand care and procedures to cover cuts and abrasives. Uh, chapter 1.3 is organization policies and procedures using PPE. Chapter 1.4, following um, respiratory hygiene and cough uh, et etiquette. Uh, chapter 1.5, follow procedures for environmental cleaning. Chapter 1.6, uh, is about transporting and processing linen in the manner that uh, controls infection, that controls the spread of infection. Uh, chapter 1.7 is the procedures for disposal of waste. Um, chapter 1.8, this is just the if overview of the, you know, what's in the chapters, are uh, the procedures for handling and cleaning plant, plant equipment. 1.9 is to respond to a situation where additional proportions may be needed. So in chapter 1.1, uh, with the hand hygiene, I just have a little video of somebody showing hand hygiene instead of us all rushing out to the basin and doing it. We did it during simulation already, um, but you know, just as a refresher and as a reminder, and then, of course, for the ones that are watching Zoom, it's easier yeah, and you can't drag my computer <laughs> around the corner. So I will display that video. If I can get play.
so just to keep your little reminder on washing your hands. So just take a bit of extra care, take a bit of extra time, make sure you like getting into all the little places that um, we won't do when we're just gently washing our hands. Um, you yeah, sing a little song while you're doing it. <laughs> it always helps a bit. Um, chapter 1.2, implement hand care, procedures that cover, cut, uh, that cover cuts and abrasions. So with cuts and abrasions, um, we uh, have to consider that there um, is bacteria around and that it grows. Sometimes if you put um, gloves on, that's an ideal environment for bacteria to grow because it gets all flippy and uh, horrible inside your glove. Um, so if you've got any cuts or abrasions on your fingers, on, on, your, on your hand, um, you could get an infection. You've got a high um, possibility of getting an infection just because of the ideal environment that is within gloves. So how do we protect? We have to all put a bit of lotion on when you finish washing your hands, put a bit of lotion on. Even the men have to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, always um, that's more preventing, but and when you have a cut, put a, you know, cover it with a, um, a plaster that is um, sort of that has to be resistant to water, like it has to be water um, tight because yeah, it will wash off in no time actually. So what I always do when I start my shift, I always first wash my hands or I first put a bit of alcohol rub on my hand. And if you put the alcohol rub on, you'll feel immediately there's a little cut somewhere. So then you know, okay, I need to take extra precautions in you know, washing my hands. So just the just remember, your hands is, you know, everything to you. You're going to be going so many places. Wash your hands before you go into the client's room. Wash your hands when you come out of the client's room. Even if you just go in there to put down a cup of tea, because they might have touched somewhere, or you touch the door or something, you know. And it, the cleaners normally go, they used to, I don't know what the frequency is now, but they used to only do a like one or two rooms um, on a wing and, you know, like say maybe five rooms in a home um, every day. So they have to make friends. So not all the rooms are cleaned every day. So some rooms are only cleaned every second day or every third day, depending on what the roster is. So it is really actually up to us to make sure that the rooms are clean, you know. And it used to be our job. In the 80s, it used to be the, the assistant nurses' jobs. So chapter 1.3, follow organizations for, uh, procedures for choice of PPE. And I've got another little video just with the PPE now. Um, it's a little bit more than what we usually would have put on. In the UK, when I was working there, we had to wear the gowns, the plastic gowns, but they, they were not sleeve, they didn't have sleeves, they just come over your neck. Um, we have some of them at the chip at Lodge as well. You would put that on when you work with dirty linen and stuff, you know, when you have to. Um, at some stage, I'm saying, oh, we need to put it on working with every client, but it's really hot in Queensland, and unless it's really necessary, uh, you know, it's really hard. In the UK, we have to wear the gowns. We were really watched every time we go into a residence room, we have to put a plastic gown on. This is a different gown. This is more the COVID gown. Obviously, if somebody has a temperature, you will you will um, wear yourself up to like this. You know, you put the, your PPE on like this. Um, the other night, I actually had a shift at the shift of on Sunday night. I had to wear a mask the whole shift through because I worked here. Um, and we were called out to one of the little uh, flats outside. We went, I went there with the nurse and you know, we looked at the old lady said, oh, she had stomach ache and you know, something wrong with her. And then um, we called the ambulance because she, her blood pressure was quite high and her temperature was, you know, it was 30, 36.9 or something. So it was going for 37. So anyway, so we called the ambulance. When the ambulance arrived, the first thing they did was take a temperature. 
when they took a temperature, temperature was already over 37. And immediately they stopped, they stepped back, they said to us, we have to go and put some extra gear on. And they went outside and they geared up like this. So, um, and then while I was there, I was called by one, our CEO and our trainer there, and she's saying, oh, can you come to some COVID training, disease training? So I said, no, I'm going to resign. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't going to go uh, first night back there in so many months and go and sit and listen to her for half an hour. I wasn't up to that. But um, yeah, so this is the way you would gear up if anyone has any issues, okay? So generally, if you just glove up and maybe put an apron on. Shield 
or goggles, and lastly, the mask or respirator. With removing the PPE, you will be doing this inside the patient care area. However, if you wore a respirator, the respirator will be removed once you leave the patient care area. First, remove the gloves. Do not touch the outside of the gloves because they are considered contaminated. To remove the gloves, start by taking your non-dominant gloves hand to grab the other glove around the cup in the wrist area. Do this by using a pinching motion to grab it. Peel this glove off by turning it inside out and wad it to a ball with your glove hand. Keep it securely in your glove hand. Then take the index finger of the ungloved hand and slide it carefully under the cuff of the gloved hand and pull the glove off the hand by pushing the index finger forward against the glove. This will turn the glove inside out, dispose of the gloves. Next, remove the gown. The front of the gown and sleeves are considered contaminated, whereas the ties and inside of the gown are considered clean. Therefore, avoid touching the front of the gown and sleeves. Carefully untie or break the ties of the gown. Pull off the gown by removing the thumbs from the inserts, if present, and then move the shoulders and arms up to the gown, which helps allow the gown to slide off the body. Then from the inside, with the assistance of the arms, roll the gown away from the body by turning it inside out. Form it into a ball and discard. Then perform hand hygiene. Next, remove the face shield or goggles. Do not touch the outside of the goggles or face shield because they are considered contaminated. If goggles are used, remove the goggles by carefully grasping and lifting the back band of the goggles over the head. Dispose or clean the goggles per facilities protocol. Then remove the mask or respirator. If a mask is worn, the front of the mask is considered contaminated. Therefore, grasp the ear loop of the mask with the fingertips and remove the mask from the face. Discard the mask per facilities protocol and perform hand hygiene. If a respirator is worn, the golfing procedure is performed outside the patient care area. The front of the respirator is considered contaminated, therefore removed by the straps. Grasp the bottom strap of the mask and lift it over the head. Then grasp the top strap of the mask and lift it over the head. Dispose or reuse the mask per facilities protocol, then perform hand hygiene. Okay, so that wraps up this video on how to don and off PPE. And don't forget to check out the other videos in this nursing skills series. Hey, everyone. Okay, so any questions about that? Uh, it depends on your company you're working for. So if we, at the moment, it's not, um, you know, protocol on the car yet. But I suppose if you do work in a facility where there is COVID-19, then obviously, you know, the facility might provide that type of thing. So, um, yeah, it, again, it will depend on your company, but I think the goggles and the respirator sort of replace the face shield. So either or, you know, depending on um, where you work and what equipment they have, I suppose. Um, just some cough etiquette, and I think we've sort of seen this some on the TV safety anyways. According to the American Lung Association, sneezes and coughs <laughs> are effective ways to get rid of foreign invaders in our bodies, like germs and pollen. But they can also spread infections when not covered up. Did you know that a cough can travel as fast as 80 kilometers per hour and expels almost 3,000 droplets? A sneeze can travel up to 160 kilometers per hour and create upwards of 100,000 droplets. Respiratory etiquette goes a long way to prevent illness from spreading through direct and indirect contact from droplets on surfaces, through the air, and cross-contamination with food or water. Stop the spread. It's as easy as sneezing or coughing into your sleeve. Here's Cassandra and Joanne to show us how. Achoo! Notice Joanne's left-handed maneuver. Achoo! Well, Cassandra effectively uses her right elbow. Achoo! Even droplets from this big sneeze are stopped in their tracks. Achoo! As Joanne makes sure her nose and mouth are deep in the fabric. The best way to catch and dispose germ-filled droplets is with the tissue. Achoo! 
sneeze or cough into the tissue. Blow, hold and wipe, and toss it into the trash. Remember to always wash your hands or use alcohol rub after using your tissue. Educate your staff about respiratory etiquette. Share videos with them on how to cover up coughs and sneezes. Make sure that yeah, that's an option too. But just remember that you know you have to please wash your hands. Yeah, and I think also I think at the same time they do say some viruses last longer material. So again, when you've sneezed in your arm, you know you might be carrying the virus around in your arm, and somebody might touch your arm. Yeah, so. Um, uh, we just have to be a little bit more alert about things like that, obviously. Um, like I said, in the 80s, we did this training in the 80s, and it's just part of our, um, you know, everyday, uh, everything we did was around hygiene care and was about uh, clinical care. And at some stage, it got so relaxed, it was actually scary. You know, the, the way that trolleys and things were kept, I will just will tell you a little bit more about it as I'm going to do this. Um, procedures for environmental cleaning. So this is one of the things that um, is, uh, you know, been a huge thing because when I did my training again, we did our training in the hospital and um, clinical cleaning was part of the AIM's job. We had, we all had a turn to clean the, the um, Wound room, the room where the treatment room, where all the um, cover, you know, all the bandages and stuff was kept. Uh, it was done daily. We used to go in there. We had this little sachet of pink, um, like a dark pink, almost red liquid in, and we used to pour, tear it open, pour it out, and then um, on onto a clean cloth and wipe a certain areas dispose of the gloves. We always were taught just to not to, if you go over from uh, uh, you wipe the table like that, you don't go back. We were taught to just go one way and to dispose every time you've gone that way, you know. So it was a lot of, a lot more focus on, on clinical care in those days. Everything was washed down. We used to wash down the pit the patient's bedside cupboards, the beds. Um, we used to, yeah, all the, whenever there's wound care was done in the 80s, we used to get a packet that was like wrapped in a big, um, it's like a green blue color paper. And, um, you know, and you'd tear that paper open. And inside that paper was um, the kidney bowl, the sterile water, tweezers, um, all the bandages, everything you needed was all wrapped up in this green paper. And it was packed, sterile, sterile packed. The things were sterilized, but we think we didn't dispose of those things, like the kidney bowl and the tweezers, and those things used to go back to the place where they sterilize it and they could put it into. Um, Big uh, uh, ovens type places where they just clean, sterilize things in. And then, yeah, and then you get this um, bandage. Everything was done like that. Catheters, everything was done like that. If you get a, put a catheter in, you get a whole packet and you open the packet on a clean surface and everything inside was, was considered sterile. And, you know, and the catheter tube would be in there, your gel that you use. To, these days, they've got a trolley and the catheter tubes are in there, just in one little plastic tubing. The outside of the tubing has been touched by a million people. The trolley is not wiped out. And then the gel that you use comes from a tube that has been squirted from one person to the next. There's nothing sterile about it, you know. Then um, probably towards the middle 90s, from when I you know, went out of the hospital, we, we started seeing MRSA, um, SARS viruses, all these viruses used to come in, you know, and this way people lose their limbs 
because they get an infection and then their arm just right off. Uh, and, or if whenever they get MRSA in a wound that just wouldn't heal and you have the most awful wound, and then, you know what happened? They took that job away from the AIS and they gave it to the cleaners. And the cleaners did not have proper training. So it's just unreal thinking. I mean, even now, if I think of the chip at large, our treatment room is not, it's not sterile. It's definitely not sterile. You know, those cupboards, I've never seen anyone go in there and wipe those cupboards down. Maybe they do. I haven't seen. It's the night food staff's job normally. But even as a night nurse, working night nurse, I know they don't even use the proper precautions when they're doing that. It's just a cloth and, you know, a bit of pink spray and then it's just done very wishy-washy. So it's no wonder things are at where it is at, you know. So chapter 1.5 for procedures, handling, transporting and processing of linen in a matter that controls spread of infection. I have a little video again, just how to make a bed and um, Now, I would have put an apron on if I was doing bedding, especially if it's So generally you would take that trolley to the pan room, glove up again with goggles and everything, and a deep of soil linen. So you take it from the room in that trolley, and then you go and wash it out. Yeah. No, no, it's our job. Yeah. Yeah. What does it say? Uh, yes, red bag. You have to be bold. You can't. Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, no, you can't do You have to be bold. We have red bags, you write about the red bags, it is a red bag, and I'll, I'll show you the red bag just now, but um, you have to be bold, you can't, because even if you have it, if you've seen, us, if you wash it, it's going to stay in that red bag, where is it going to go? No, it's a red bag, it's a red bag. Not in our facilities, we have washable red bags that come back to us. Yeah. In an ideal world, that would be fantastic. No, but yeah, and uh, Good Shepherd Lodge, we have red, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't. I have never seen those bags, so I'm not even sure if they exist in Australia. Maybe I don't know where that book was written, but yeah, I've never seen that. I in all my 30 years, I've never seen a disposable bag. bag. (laughs) No, you will definitely not see that. Yeah. 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 No, you're going to. It's a red bag. That's right, and I will show you how they look, but um. Yeah, so you have your trolley, the idea is to remember to bring your trolley into the room and you have your trolley near the bed when you take never to hold linen and go to your clothes and then you have to go deep out. Yeah, the laundry will be really, because usually the red packs is the indication for them that it has to be washed separately, but they still peel the bags open and, and throw the clothes into the washing machine. And even then, have you ever washed paper? in the washing machine you know it, it stays in there it's not going anywhere so, yeah and it goes nowhere that bits and pieces just stay there so it's not going to go anywhere the clumpy bits are still going to stay in the machine if you don't bulk it so you have to be bulk it in an ideal world it would be fantastic if we have types of machines that can deal with that but they don't they just say it's all the same. They would wash stuff that comes out of the red bag in a higher um, temperature uh, cycle, and they would treat it as infectious when it reaches the, the um, laundry. But it's our job to debulk it. So you throw it in the red bag, go to the pan room. Normally at the pan room, you have, and years ago when I worked in Namibia, we had fantastic debulking. Um, it was almost like a bar, but it was lifted up to um, to a nice high level, and it was all stainless steel, and you had a big, huge, uh, power, high power um, gurney that we used to just hold the linen down, and you just, you know, we bulk it, and it had a big drain, like a toilet drain at the end, and you could just splash it with your foot, and it would all go. At Good Shepherd Lodge, they have big silver big stainless steel um, bases and above the basin is a type of a gurney or high pressure hose and as long as you lay your um, linen with the, the pool facing away from you but you have to gear up anyway you would put a plastic um, apron on you would put glasses on you would put a um, uh, mask on and obviously your, your gloves as well and then you would just uh, with a high pressure um, hose, you would just wash the pool off. You don't have to physically take, you know, you use the water to wash it off and then roll it up again and put it back in the red bag and flush. It also flushes. It's actually got a little button against the wall and you press it and then it flushes. Get very frustrated with the maintenance because they put a little grit in that basin, like a little trap. Uh, I always, whenever I have a bulk, uh, you know, linen that has got pieces on, I always, it's just screwed in there. I always screw the little, the little cap off. It's like a little hat that's sitting there with little holes. Because the food just goes sit around that little oh, yeah. hole and you can't get it out, you know. So I always screw it out, put the stupid little thing out. Sometimes you can throw this away because oh. They shouldn't be in there. It should have a big drain so that the food can go down the drain. I mean, I have showered people where they poo in the shower and then the poo falls on the floor in the shower and you try to wash that poo down the drain. I'm telling you, it's not possible. It does not go down those little grits. It just doesn't. You have to pick it up. You have to glove up and get a piece of toilet paper and pick it up and throw it in the toilet because you do not, the, as hard as you squirt water at it, it never dissolves enough to go through that little grits. It just doesn't. So could you imagine in a washing machine? It will not, it will be devastating. No. It just, yeah, and you know, and it's like taking on her on the bit, around the hole and you have to press it to go through and then it goes, sits in your drain into the drain um floods up the drain so yeah 
that's what I was saying. I would have had a apron on. Yeah. So in Could general, a mask on. Probably could benefit from that as well, especially yeah, especially in today's yeah, today's day and age. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely would. Yeah, definitely would. I agree. Um, and also when you when you make a bed, don't shake the the bedding. You know, if you have somebody in a bed and you don't you don't change the bed every day, good shepherd. We only change every bed. A bed gets changed once a week, and it's on the schedule to be changed unless it's soiled or, or, or wet. Um, so all their skin cells and stuff are in the linen. So when you're making the bed, don't do that. <laughs> you know, just make it. Just pull it right, you know, be careful. And also when you put the blanket on, put the blanket down and let your, your partner come take the other side. Yeah, fold it uh, close somehow. I always put it in a little triangle and then I push the triangle back and then you know, it's easy to fold it open again. So you'll make your own little way about it. But yeah, don't um, shake it. Um, so yes, yeah, just little things. Um, so that's contaminated waste. I've got another one. As a caregiver, an important part of your role is to make sure any medical waste in the home of the person you're caring for is safely disposed of. If healthcare waste is not dealt with properly, it can be hazardous to you and anyone else who may come into contact with it after disposal. In this video, we'll teach you how to identify home healthcare waste, identify biohazardous waste, and safely dispose of both to minimize any possible health risks. So what exactly is healthcare waste? Basically, it's any waste that is produced during the physical care of the person you're caring for. This includes disposable gloves, soiled dressings, and incontinence products. For a complete list, take a look at our care guide. To safely dispose of these items at home, double bag them and make sure both bags are tightly closed with a knot or a twist tie. Never put any home healthcare waste in the recycling bin. These items are not recyclable. Certain types of medical waste are considered to be biohazardous and pose a greater risk of injury and infection than regular home healthcare waste. Biohazardous home healthcare waste includes human blood and sharks. Sharks are any item with sharp or pointed edges that can puncture the skin, like needles, syringes, injectors, injection pens, and lancets. Never put any of these items in regular garbage, recycle, or organic bins, and don't flush sharks down the toilet. Always place discarded sharks and human blood waste in an approved biohazard container for safe disposal. You can also get approved containers and disposal advice from your local pharmacist. All approved containers must be labeled with the universal biohazard symbol. Your province or region may offer programs to help you dispose of biohazardous waste like sharks. Programs like the Ontario Sharks Return Program is one such example that provides a safe and easy way to dispose of any sharks you may have in your home. To learn more about sharks and where you can dispose of them, take a look at our care guide. Proper disposal of home healthcare waste is key for keeping both you and the person you're caring for safe. While this video is a good starting point for learning how to safely dispose of healthcare waste, it is not meant to be a comprehensive guide. For more detailed information, click our link to see our care guide. Be sure to subscribe and watch our other videos for additional caregiver support and resources. Okay, all the way from Canada. So these are the, this is how the Australian um, uh, sharks containers look. You also don't overfill them. You only fill them next to the black line on the thing and then they, and they normally in the pan rooms um, and then take them to the nurse. Um, she'll keep them in the, um, uh, into the nurse's um, medical room. And they will dispose. So it's very expensive to, for companies to dispose of um, a biohazard um, or a sharp containers or any yellow bag. They've got a special system or a special pickup um, system for, for that. So, um, yeah, we also throw the disposable razors in these containers. So, just um, always when you finish only one, one of use and throw them away as well. You know, make sure that in these containers don't throw them in a normal black bag. Um, and then there's these 
a yellow burn usually somewhere in the vicinity um, that you can go through and they would have yellow bags in the candles as well if you have somebody that has shingles or somebody that has had some or other um you know extra uh, cautions then normally there will be a yellow bag in front of their room there will be ppe in front of their room and that's an indication to you that there's somebody you need to take extra precautions for and that would go into the clinical bin. You have to go throw that away in the end of the clinical. Then you get um, uh, toxic waste. The toxic waste is normally for people with um, uh, that going through chemotherapy, or if they have uh, lipoarthritis, then you use there will be a purple um, bin or purple bag, and your PPE is purple as well. You get special PPE for that because the medication that they're taking can affect you the radiation can affect you and especially if you're pregnant it can be quite devastating because it breaks down cells so it can actually um you know harm you so just take extra precautions with, with dealing with that as well then there's the um, in australia it generally looks like that not often you have a blue bag but most of the time you do have a, a red bag for uh, body fluids, linen and stuff. We have a white bag. We have a trolley with three bags in. We normally put a plastic uh, um, bin bag in the third, like in the blue one. We will put a plastic bin bag where we throw the nappies in. So um, the white is for clean linen or clean, uh, not clean, but clothes that is not soiled. So if you take the clothes off and there's no, no pieces or urine on it, the yellow bag is when you have a disease, some sort of a disease. Yeah, when there's some sort of a disease present that got um, herpes so or they would have their own bin system. Oh, it okay. wouldn't be this trolley. This trolley would be for the ward. You would, they would have their own. And normally, it's just one little bin. Like she had there making the bed, it only has a trolley with just one bag, in, and then that would be yellow and that would be separate from this so yeah um this is if you just go through the, the, the you know through the hallways and you just from room to room to room you'll take this one with you um but obviously if there's somebody that's infectious and you don't have a separate system um i don't know what they do with COVID and COVID in other areas you know like in down south um, in the homes, I'm not sure how they deal with that. I'm pretty sure it's quite complicated actually. It must be really, really complicated. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it would be extremely complicated because for one thing is that you, you'd have to keep, each person would have to have their own trolley. Um, each person would have had their own disposable system. Um, how to deal with that, taking it to the laundry is a different system. Um, each person that goes, and I think every person's room you go into, you have to have disposable to get rid of all that gear in their room, leave it in their room. Um, it would be unthinkable, you know. Let's also be very realistic about this. This is a virus and we probably will all get it eventually. So with Shepherd Lodge is busy gearing up a whole um, wing uh, specifically for COVID, but obviously it would, you know, it would look different to what I'm presenting to you today. Today is not, this is not a COVID um, unit. It's not specifically designed for, yeah. for that. Um, no, the uh, government has put a unit and attached a unit to this um, to this course, but they haven't designed the material yet. So it's not. Um, they normally government gives you about a year to get the material up and running. Obviously, I reckon they would have to put a bit of speed on it at the moment. Um, yes, uh, and like I said, I could ship it lots on Sunday night. My uh, trainer they want give me a train specifically in it. So a company will train you as well. The companies themselves will have extra training for that. So um, the next one is uh, cleaning equipment to prevent um, 
any spirit of contamination when you are dealing with stuff? To prevent and control infection, first we need to understand how infection spread through the chain of infection. The chain of infection is made up of six different links. Infection occurs when each link is present in this order. But the chain is easy to break. Each link can be broken, which prevents disease and keeps patients safe. Let's go through each link. An infectious agent is an organism having the ability to cause disease. To break this link, seek prompt treatment if you are ill and use the right cleaning solution to disinfect the pathogens you have identified. The second link is a reservoir. A reservoir is where pathogens can thrive and reproduce, like tabletops, doorknobs, and people. Break this link by washing your hands, keeping a clean environment, and disinfecting surfaces. Next in the chain is the portal of exit, which is how the pathogen leaves the reservoir, such as sneezes or coughs. Break this link by wearing personal protective equipment, washing your hands, properly disposing of trash, and covering your cough or sneeze. The fourth link is the mode of transmission. This is how pathogens are carried from one place to another, even on the hands of a healthcare worker. To break this link, wash your hands, control airflow in negative pressure rooms, Disinfect surfaces, handle food properly, and observe isolation precautions. Next, the chain includes the portal of entry. It's the way pathogens enter the host, like breaks in the skin. Healthcare workers break this link by practicing a septic technique during procedures, taking proper care of wounds, washing their hands, and properly caring for pathogens. The last link in the chain of infection is the susceptible host. The host is a person who cannot defend against pathogens, such as the elderly or burn patients. Healthcare workers break this link by treating the primary disease and identifying those at higher risk for infection. As a healthcare environmental services technician, you can see how your daily duties give you many chances to break the chain and keep everyone safe from illness. So, um, this uh, respond to additional proportions. So, if there's um, if there's an outbreak, um, the year before last, not last year, the year before. Three years ago, we had a virus that went around the car that also killed some elderly. Um, uh, Northview was actually a big trouble because they, were, they had quite high death rates during that, and they were the full on the news and everything that um, they um, infection control was not standard when they were um, audited. So we managed to. Um, Stop the virus, um, it had a name in the mind now, in Good Shepherd by extreme vigorous hand washing. So, hand washing is your first line of defense and your best line of defense. No glove, no PPE, nothing is as good as washing your hands and your hand times. You know, just keep washing your hands and you'll be fine. You'll be fine. It is. Infections are still vulnerable, if, you know, as long as we break the chain, we'll be fine. So just remember to do that. Um, I think the chapter two, identifying infection hazards and, as, um, and other risks. Um, infection, I'll discuss with the chapter. Chapter 2.1, identify infection hazards associated with your own role in your work environment. So types of infections, when you walk into somebody's room, they've got a fever. So obviously when you feel, you know, touch them, you'll feel they warm to touch. They, you might see they, they look sweaty or they, they shaking, they're feeling like that lady on Sunday night when you got into a room, she 
she was shaking, you know, she was under a blanket and she was shaking. So that is an um, indication that there's some sort of infection going on. Um, frequent urination, a knee pressing the bubble, they need to go to the toilet. Some funny discharge, they might have a discharge in the urine, the urine might have like a cloudiness on it or some sort of a discharge. Um, there might be a redness, when you have a cut, there's redness around the cut, it's swollen and red and it won't be touched, that is um, indication it's an infection. Bad odour, so if somebody's breath is very smelly or wound, you open a wound and that wound is smelly, then you know that the infection in there. Obviously, diarrhea and vomiting is caused a, a high infection as well. Um, when you have diarrhea and vomiting, you're not allowed to work for um, I think it's 48 hours, two days. If you've had a spell of diarrhea and vomiting, you're not allowed to go back into the uh, HK home for 48 hours. So you have to stay home for two days. Um, and then shingles is another one that is um, quite common actually in the Kai. I've had so many clients that has shingles in the Kai. Yep. It's an uh, it's part of the um it's it's part of the um, German measles um, um uh, infection um or um it's but it, it's also part of uh, uh, herpes uh, yeah. Problems. So it's yeah, you get like, little like sores. Yeah. Ah. But, uh, yeah. You get a little red sore. Mm -hmm. So it's really dangerous for women, pregnant women. So um, yeah, and it's very contagious, or can be very contagious, especially if the if skin breaks and um, they're oozing. Yeah. So if you have had German measles, are you more susceptible to Yes, I think so. <clears throat> yeah, I think if you never had German measles. Yeah, and a lot of the elderly has it. It is, you know, not uncommon. But as long as the areas are covered, as long as they the nurse put a you know bandage on it, it's generally okay. But most of the time they do treat them as infectious. So there'd be a yellow bin in front of their room and they would be beaten in front of that person's room and that person would not be allowed to come out of the room for the time that they have to school and the nurses would make you aware if, if you're pregnant you're not allowed to work with that person and then obviously you have to take extra precautions by washing your hands and things when you go and work with that person. Uh, eczema? Yeah, um, I think as, again, the pie, you know, the dry weather, the, the hot weather does have a huge effect on people having eczema. Um, I must say, I, in the UK, I never yeah, saw as much know. eczema. I It must be an um, uh, uh, allergic reaction. Yeah. yeah. Allergies won't be uh, won't be infectious, you know. It won't be if, if that person, even if they have bad skin and and really bad eczema, it won't be infectious to you unless they've got MRSA in their wounds. That 
if that scratched a lot and they've got some sort of a, a multiple bacteria in there, we'll stain that, you must take precautions. But the, and it's all, not always very obvious that somebody's got MRSA. It would be in the hair plant somewhere hidden, but they won't, the nurse, you, unless you ask, you won't know. Um, it's like, it's no, it's yeah. discriminating. It's like when somebody has AIDS, then they don't have to declare it. So you could work with somebody that has that and not know, you know? So treat everyone like they are extremely so infectious. Like all, all so. people, people the blood they could the blood and so yeah. They get water damage. Yeah. That is the big one. Yeah. Yeah. Infectious. Yeah. And it's nothing. Yeah. But treat everyone like they are infectious. They you but that's the best way to deal with it. So sometimes of microorganisms are bacteria that's uh, only harm harmful to humans. Uh, viruses like herpes, rubella, Ross River, that's, um, uh, that, you know, there's flus, um, COVID, uh, fungus, ringworm, thrust, athlete's foot. Um, funny enough, uh, ringworm and athlete's foot could be contagious, but thrust is not contagious. <laughs> so it, I suppose it's, you know, but it is a type of fungus, um, and you will probably get with your little kids, you see they've got yellow on them on their tongue, and then um, they get a rash on their bum. That's a thrust that's gone right through. Yes, it goes through your system. You know, you can you can get thrust. You can. Some people are sensitive. Yeah, yeah, and if you get kids, yeah, and the old people get it as well. So you can do you do get it with old people. Then there's algae that's found in, and some algae are actually harmful. So if you have like, I think it's the, the white algae, if you have white algae in a zoo or, you know, on the wall, growing on a wall, it's actually really, really poisonous, uh, breathing it in. So when you're working in people's lives, rooms, um, houses, and um, they've got, uh, back, you know, they've got mold in their walls, um, just be cautious because do wear masks and stuff because that um, algae you breathe that in as well it's millions of spores out in the air that has can have effect on your um, on your lungs and then there's parasites like worms and scabies um in a okay, there's a lot of people with scabies it's just unreal actually also be aware of that it's it's just apparently like something mad well, it's easily treated. It's just the one of treatment to really treat it. But yeah, there are things like that out there. Um, so um, the definition of bacteria is a type of a life, a form of life, is it, um, existing in a unicell organism. A fungi is a type of organism with rigid cells that lack, lacks um, chlorophyll, and a virus is a uh, um, uh, in my, uh, a minute infection organizes an organizes organism lacking independent met metabolism and relying on the host for um, replication. So identifying areas of responsibility in relation to infection and prevention and control. Prevention and control, here it is. Treat everyone, both staff and clients, as if they are infected, regardless of whether they are not. You know, just treat people, you know, just be careful because you don't know. You don't know what they have. Uh, consider all blood and bodily fluids as infectious. So if you have a splatter in your face, you're busy working with somebody and you get a urine in your eyes, Report it. Report it as with an incident form because you could get a massive infection from it. You could get hepatitis B from it or hepatitis A. So um, just report it as infectious, get treatment. Um, access contact and appropriate measures. So yeah, you have to go see your doctor. You have to, and it's um, um, dealt as a workplace injury. 
a splatter, any type of splatter. Um, control measures, yes, on page 26 is some more control measures, but um, uh, eliminate hazards processes, use personal PPE, isolate uh, with dynamic barricades, use uh, safe handling techniques, follow infection control policies, and follow good personal hygiene. Very, very important, just wash your hands, you know, can't stretch it enough. It was funny, like, last year when I was doing uh, this unit and um, January, some of my students that did this unit with me last year, they came to me and they said to me, you must have a laugh now. I said, why? They said, because you told us, like, we have to wash our hands a million times and here we have it now, you know, and like, people, this is not anything new. It's not new, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, really. Um, as long as you wash your hands, I remember when I did my hospital planning in 1980, we had a RN, her surname was um, Chamberlain. She was, oh, she was old school, hard, difficult person. She used to spot you on a, you know, kilometer away and shout at you down the hallway. And she used to always say to us, she, she actually hated gloves. She felt gloves were just um, the storage, you know, was just the ideal environment for bacteria to grow and in infections to, you know, get captured. So she, she used to make us work with our gloves. She used to wash our hands, like while well, you're busy with the client, you go wash your hands off when you come back. We used to wash our hands so much. And she was just on up with us about that, washing our hands, washing our hands. And, you know, even working with poo, she would not let, let us wear gloves. She would force us to work with it so we can realize that it's so dirty. And you go stand afterwards and scrub your hands and carry on. But she'd make us so we can realize how important it is to wash our hands. Sometimes I still forget because it's been drilled into me so much that I go into somebody's room and I start caring for them and I don't have gloves on. And I don't see any problem with it because I was I was trained that as long as I wash my hands, I'm okay, you know? I'm not taking anything into that client's room. I've washed my hands and my hands is properly washed. I'm not taking anything out of their room because my hands is properly washed. What does the glove do? What's different to the glove? The glove has been packed in the factory by, who knows, somebody picking his nose while packing the glove, scratching his bum and carrying on, you know? One day, like, we don't know where Exactly. Yeah. So just personal cleansiness is your, your first line of defense. If you get exposed, immediately jump in the shower. Most facilities have showers. Always carry an extra uniform with you. Always have an extra uniform with you. Because if you do get exposed, you know, we don't wear items all the time. You know, you work from client to client to client. Obviously, outside of COVID, um, you know, then it's good to go and jump in the shower quickly, have a good shower. I got splashed with, with pee couple of years ago, right in my face. I was so shocked, but I just went straight into the shower. I just scraped my face. I didn't even go into the shower. I went into the pan room and I got that high pressure hose. <laughs> and I was hunting myself. Obviously, you don't wear makeup while you're working in there, you know, because everything sweats off anyway. It melts off. So, assessing risks, determining the likelihood and the severity of harm. So the risks are bodily fluids and the fluids exposure, sharps injuries. Sharps injuries are up there, one of the most um, common things happening to nurses. Um, I've cut myself with a razor. Somebody didn't expose with the razor properly. I, I pulled the bin out, the bin bag out with the pads in to take to um, the, at the end of my shift to the big bin. And there was a razor in there, I cut myself. Um, the big thing as well when you cut yourself with a razor um, or with any sharp, you get pricked with a sharp. Hepatitis A is a big thing, and Australia is still very high um, 
uh, levels of, even though we don't, you know, we think third world countries, we realize how bad it's been, and Australia is just as bad. Hepatitis A and hepatitis B is very common. So that's why we do get um, humanized against it when you work in the older child, but check your levels of you can get it from water as well, but yeah, you do get it from, from people and it affects your liver. So it attacks your liver and your... Um, but you could have gotten it from a swimming pool. Yeah, you can get it from a swimming pool. Yeah, because if people pee in the swimming pool and then you, you know, swim in the pool. I got it when I was 13, I was so sick. About six months, my eyes were yellow. My oh, I was yellow. I had to drink this massive big yellow uh, liver tablets. Horrible stuff. So um, then, of course, AIDS falls in the same category than hepatitis. You know, um, AIDS are still a pre prevalent um, uh, disease in today's AIDS, uh, day and age. Millions of people still die every year of AIDS. Um, they, and because people don't have to declare their, their status, their AIDS status, we possibly have worked with people that have AIDS. You would not know. But because it's more treatable these days, um, people don't necessarily die from it. So they can live a long, long time even having AIDS or being HIV positive. So, you know, that is also a real, a real issue. Uh, we have one of our students in our class, her dad has got TB, got tuberculosis, so, and highly contagious um, uh, until you start medication. So, yeah, so before you start the uh, at least one strain of TB that resists Oh, yes, there is. There's many strains that resist and these are strains that I don't go to your lungs, they go to your brain. Um, you can get TB by walking. If you're walking bare feet and somebody had sat there and you walk, you can absorb it in your feet. I heard a story of a young doctor in South Africa that got TB in Durban and she got it in her brain, she got paralyzed and she um, threw a needle foot injury at work. So, um, what actually is it? TB, tuberculosis, it goes into your lungs, it's a type of uh, um, bacteria, it's a type of bacterial infection, yeah, it could, yeah. I've, I have nursed people with TB, I've had a, um, a lady in the 80s yes. that, um, yes, yes, yeah. No, maybe it wasn't as accurate. I know when you come to Australia, we have all have to do lung X-rays, so it's um, it's you know they still check for that. Um, yes, you can, but mostly it is quite resistive, and you do live with it for a very long time. Yeah, um, uh, it's a very hard, a very low percentage of people actually recover from it. Most people actually um, live with it for the rest of their lives. Um, like I say, one of our students, I won't say, we put in our class, uh, her dad got to do. Um, then uh, bacterial infections, of course, if you, you know, cut yourself or you get some sort of a bacterial infection. COVID-19, there's so many, I mean, it's not the last one we've seen. I'm sure there's going to be more, like there was the bird flu and there was this and there was that and there was this, and, and Africa was the, um, you know, uh, what is it called? Uh, not the SARS, the one where they um, diarrhea and vomiting. Oh. Um, Ebola, yeah. So it's still everywhere. It's still there's up. And the thing with Ebola is that it actually the the amount of people that kills that uh, death rate is much higher than with COVID. So um, yeah, it's still prevalent, and we do live in a world that is unfortunately 
people just haven't taken care enough and been not mindful enough and things have gone out of control. Um, and of course, at the same time, of course, the, the world is just a healthy place. There are people out there that are the supporting habits and um, unfortunately that's how it happens. You know, like they reckon AIDS have come over from monkeys into humans. Now, how does that transfer happen? Only one way I can think about, you know. Yeah, get exposed to it, yeah. Now, there's some revolting things, and you know. Yeah. But they not all the always the 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 they not always the what's the word I'm looking for the the, the always the ones that actually necessarily cause it. You know, it's Western world people going into places and having sex with monkeys and sex with animals that these things come from. It's perverted, uh, intelligent people, perverted, intelligent people that deliberately sometimes cause these things. So, yeah, it's crazy madness in this world. So, yeah, unfortunately, these things are not. No, I mean, it's like, yeah, so sorry, it's unthinkable, but there are things. She's always been. Yeah. 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 She's always been more predominant. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes not uh, comfortable with clothes. So I'm with my sandal and I cannot walk in on the phone. It could make it a little bit of a whole thing. There's one outside and one in the middle. So we're all having a quite fun. So, um, document and report activities and tasks that put yourself and clients and visitors or other workers at risk. Always report, um, you know, to your supervisor, to the appropriate people. Identify appropriate control measures to minimize this risk and according to organization policies, these um, things like wearing our PPE, washing our hands, making sure things are debulked. Like you are going to walk into a, uh, you, you chose elderly screen, you're going to walk into somebody's room and there's going to be pieces up on the roof and they're on the side of the wall <laughs> and all over the face <laughs> and everywhere in the hair and you know, there's not much to do but um, in minimizing those risks. They are out there, and you know, and that's how hepatitis B is spread. So be aware of that, that um, you don't get exposed when you know things are being. So, some added precautions, of course, face mask, aprons, shoe covers. You get these paper shoe covers, you can put the one thing we do always forget is our shoes. You know, we're in an outer room with a shoe on the floor, and we carry on keeping our bodies up here clean, but not remembering that we just step all over everything. I always um, spray my shoes before I go home with the clean spray brush. Get this antibacterial spray in the pan rooms and wash your shoes off. Um, the cats obviously love my shoes when I come back from the old age home, but the city is full of these smells and walk everywhere. People pee on the floor when they put dementia. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, good thing. I mean, my friend were and the daughter was having a real nice laugh last week. We were talking about all the situations where we found ourselves in. Me and my friend's daughter, we worked together in Whitehaven, and somebody had pooed on the tree. How do you poo on the tree? I don't know. When we got out there, the the um a bottle, a blue bottle flies were like all like. Have a, it looked like there's flies in there. Oh man, and we were oh, so many times we had that. It's just bad. And we were 
And quite often when the three of us are together, because we work together for so long, my husband gets really angry with us because we were busy din having dinner and we, then we remember something or something that happened and we start talking to each other and oh, think about it. And you guys and he just stops talking. <laughs> we have all these, you know, it becomes part of your conversation without you realizing when you work in HK because you do it so often. Um, and yeah, and it's like not not it's funny more than what it is. And it creates moments of um, of fond memories of the times that you you know well, when you're in that situation obviously you feel differently. But washing your hands, um, you know, making sure that you keep your hands clean. I actually do not like the alcohol rub. I don't like it. It's like sticky it. and it, you know, I, and anyway, so I'm sure I read somewhere that some bacteria are resistant to that rub. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so wash your hands, forget about the alcohol rub, just keep washing your hands. Don't worry about the alcohol rub. I, I feel at the same time when like when they bought the cleaners in to take our job away, they also bought the alcohol rub in, and that was the um, uh, that was the time when when these uh, viruses started, you know, these um, SARS and um, MRSA and started, started spiking in the hospitals. Is when that shift happened when they bought the alcohol rub into the hospital. Before that, we had we didn't have alcohol. Up. We only had soap and water. So um, yeah, then uh, changing waste management requirements. Uh, this uh, PPE briefing your clients before contact. Yeah, uh, working with them, real you know, making them aware of their situation. Sometimes you know you are in a bit of a tip. Yeah, my darling, let's. Um, Let's try to help you the best we can. Try not to pull a face. You know, you have to get your resting face. Practice your resting face <laughs> and you don't show them. <laughs> and dedicate a disposable equipment for that specific client. You know, that's what they do mostly. Um, we had a resident on Sunday night. Um, we pass a room and I suddenly there was, a, there was a dedicated trolley in front of a room with a yellow bag and I was why is that? Oh, yes. And nobody told us. There was nothing in hand over nothing. She had come back from the hospital and they were taking isolation precautions with her. Nobody said anything to us. I was in that room five, six times before the, the trolley appeared oh, on no, the no, outside no, of the room. No, 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 no. no notices. They don't put notices. And the only notice you have is the only clue you could get is if, if a nurse or a RN or the, you know, realized that, oh, maybe we should put contact precautions and they put an actual um, yellow bag outside the room, you know, otherwise you won't know. The same with MRSA, you don't know, you know, it's not cold. So just treat them as if they all are infectious anyways. I wash my hands anyways a million times, you know, my hands are so dry now and yeah, my nails are splitting and stuff because I wash my hands so much. So just put, keep putting cream on them. Um, something that is really good, I don't have it here because I took it home, but it's in, it in my baggie on uh, Sunday night, is the, um, uh, not the eucalyptus, the other one, uh, tea tree oil or the tea tree ointment. Um, you get it in a little, uh, little uh, hand rub as well. Because tea tree is an antibacterial uh, thing. So if you put it on your hands, if the bacteria comes in, contact with your hand, it won't breathe on your hand. So, um, but, and it smells nice as well, but it's treated more as like an after you've washed your hands, uh, to moisturize your hands more than what you treat it to uh, uh, clean your hands with it, you know. I've got the tea tree spray as well, and I will use that as well after, you know, clean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have read one of them myself, and then someone told me, "This is a charity thing. Just put some drop on the bottom and put it after the day. It's gone." Ah. Okay. 
very yeah, me too. Don't, don't, don't go to the hospital. Yeah, yeah, very good. So, yeah, I mean, I know, like with knits, uh, they say tea tree. Mm -hmm. I put the tea tree in my granddaughter's hair when I was spray some tea tree, and it's just got that curly hair. She had knits a few weeks ago. But grandma got bikes and you know, I treated her, she did all oh, man, it was a mission. But yeah, apparently the tea, tea trees was for that as well. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Sorry, I no no. Um I'm trying to finish before eleven, which I will, and then you'll have a break and do the questions afterwards. Chapter three. If you want to catch up with the questions later, you can catch up on yeah, yeah, I'll do separate recording for the questions. No, no, that's fine. Follow procedures for managing a risk associated with specific hazards. So there's all the chapters there. Protocol for care after exposure exposure to blood or bodily fluids. Um a little how the an exposure injury is defined as a specific mucous membrane, broken skin, or punctured contact with blood or other potentially infected material that results in the performance of an employee duty. This includes contact with blood or body fluid in the form of cut, splashing of blood or body fluid in the eyes, nose, or mouth, or any situation where there is a high probability of contamination. You can keep it exposed. You can contaminate the person. Report the incident to your supervisor and then seek medical treatment. An immediate confidential post exposure medical evaluation, prophylactic treatment, which means treatment to help prevent the infection, or follow up needs to be conducted by a physician at no expense to you, the employer. Complete the forms as soon as possible after the incident, but don't delay medical treatment for all patients. Remember, the sooner we get that prophylactic treatment, the better protection will be. Now remember, the only way to confirm that an exposure happens to the line of duty is to document it. And if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So make sure you complete an exposure injury report, which includes the following. A description of circumstances of how the exposure occurred, including the route of transmission, the time, date, and place it occurred, and all people involved, including the exposed person or person. First aid provided an identification of the source and individual unless it is unfeasible for state or local law prohibits it. The source individual blood could be tested as soon as feasible and only after consent is obtained in order to determine hepatitis B virus and HIV effectiveness. Forms and continued follow-up action will proceed according to employer's policies and procedures. The employer's exposure control plan needs to specify who should be contacted and what procedures need to be done to follow up. Employers need to provide post exposure prophylaxis when medically indicated, counseling, and evaluation of reported illnesses at no charge to the employer. Remember, within your protocol, it states to go to a specific clinic or an office. Make sure that that office or clinic is equipped to be able to treat you in the time frame that's necessary to protect you folks. All right, so just remember, please report. Don't delay to report. Um, and sometimes people are scared to report because they think that made a mistake. Um, this is a no blame game when you get, you know, when there's splatter or when you get um, a needle prick injury. It's a no blame game. You cannot be blamed for it. You know, we this human report it because it's for your safety that you. With, and the safety of the people you work with. If you get exposed to something and you get sick, you will expose them to it. And you work with vulnerable people, so you have to report it. Um, so communicate the potential risks, so place appropriate signs when appropriate, when uh, appropriate. so communi to communicate the uh, potential of risk. So they say uh, display signs, Although it is not common practice to display signs um, with infectious diseases, um, the signs that they talk about here is more 
wet floor or you know there's been a, a spill really then what it is uh, a sign that somebody's actually got MRSA or you know that's not something infectious um, but it's all again according to policies and procedures some companies might have that I know in the UK we actually had signs on people before there was a sign MRSA positive and we knew that that sign was MRSA positive but not in Australia now um, yes it is yes it is and I have also uh, raised that concern many a times that you know that that is not fair that they don't warn us because we need to be warned yeah so your best uh, um, way of dealing with it is to read the client's notes you know read the client's medical notes Sometimes it's not, yes, you're right. So, but most of the time it would be if they had any treatment, so you'd have to go and, so it's nice to go sit and read their medical diagnosis, but you might have to go and decode it. You might have to copy that word and go put it on, on um, somewhere where you can um, go and, uh, you know, find out what, what that means, because, yeah, it's not, uh, you know, it's not within our scope of practice to learn all these big words necessarily, so. Um, yeah, removing spills in uh, accordance to policy. So usually in the plan room, there's a spill um, uh, parcel that would have some papers in. So sit, put some signs down, put your PPE on, and then you uh, deal with the confining the spill. And then, uh, you know, normally uh, some paper towel is quite handy, bulk it together, dispose it in double. Um, double bag so we usually use a little white bag bag it in that and then into the black bag uh, and uh, sometimes we can treat it as clinical waste it's not always treated as clinical waste as I said it's very expensive for companies to dispose of clinical waste and the UK again we treated the pads as clinical waste so we had yellow bags for the pads and it all went into a yellow bin and it was Disposed of as clinical waste. In Australia, it's not. We just use black bags. So it's different from country to country, from maybe even from um, a company to company. You know, they might decide. No, we want to treat this uh, more uh, cautiously. The the problem is, like a good shepherd lost, we have these three big, those big bins, you know, those rooms with the, they look like industrial bins. Mm -hmm. We have three of them in the, in the backyard. The, in two days, the, all three of them are full. And that's just pads that go in there. Two days. So you can imagine how yeah. many uh, pads goes to the landfill every right. day. And if you've got COVID, they've actually found that it goes through the system of the urine and the food. So therefore, it goes through the sewage system. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. So it should be treated as infectious yeah. and it should be disposed of in that manner and companies should take precautions about it, yes. Uh, but um, it's an expensive game, very expensive game. Uh, Minimise uh, contamination of materials, equipment, instruments. Uh, so prevention and control is always our best um, line of action. Uh, protect materials and equipment from uh, contamination, spraying the cloth, uh, not, this, uh, not the surface, uh, for damp wiping. Workflow should always be from clean to dirty. Um, and for cleaning schedules, uh, treat, uh, uh, follow cleaning schedules for treatment zones. So there will be a cleaning schedule in the back of the pan room doors or in the back of the um, treatment room door that will say this room needs to be cleaned, you know, twice a day, twice a week or every second day, somebody has to sign the book that they've done it. In the pan rooms also, we before COVID, we did it once a week. Um, night, night, night staff normally does it. Um, always check though, because some night staff don't do it. They mean to go around cleaning all the um, lifting equipment every evening and mean to do that. They meant to clean the fridges, the fridges and the, and the treatment rooms has to be cleaned daily by the nurses. Those are our cleaning jobs. 
treatment rooms and training rooms are our cleaning jobs. That's not a cleaner's job. So, you know, it is actually really important that we see ourselves as the, the responsible person for um, preventing infections, you know, cleaning. When you treat a client, you strip their bed, they've had a, um, uh, you know, a feces on the bed, spray the whole bed, spray the, you know, wipe the whole bed down, the, the top of the bed, the mattress, turn the mattress down, around, do the bedside cupboards and everything in the room. You don't know how far things spread. Sometimes things spread in the air and it's sometimes not always visible by eye. And um, a cleaner might not come for another two days. So, and you are going to go in there to put on the table again or put water on the bedside cupboard. Never put toilet paper on their bedside cupboard or on their little table next to, you know, where you're going to be putting the food. It's a terrible thing we do, you know, we're busy with the cares and we use the little table to put the water and the soaps and everything as we're treating them and then the toilet paper and everything goes on there and we wipe their bottoms and carry on with it and we go out the room and we come back with the, the breakfast tray and we put it on the same nice. table. It's nice. So, yeah, don't try not to do that. Try to keep that separate. I always take a plastic bag and I spray a plastic bag open next to me on the bed and I put everything I'm going to be using for them on the plastic bag and then I tie it and I take it to the plan room and I've got sorted in the plan room. So in then I know in there is, you know, the pads and the um, um, wipes and, you know, and sometimes even a face cloth we might have used and yeah, sometimes people throw the face cloth away. I have thrown face, face cloth away. The um, hair um, managers get really angry at us when they do that. But if you don't have enough wipes, it's really disgusting sometimes. But most of the time I do, I take the face cloth out then when I get to the basin and I spray them off and, you know, I put them in a red bag for the laundry. So just uh, being precautious, wiping down everything when you finish um washing them, bed bathing them, clean the surfaces around their room. There's pink spray normally in the laundry, go on the pan room, go get the pink spray, put it on a, a clean cloth or clean wipe, you get nice big cleaning wipes these days, and wipe down everything. Just wipe it once down and then, yeah, and then just get rid of that. Most of the time now you get wipes, which is an added concern for um, all the waste we have. But, um, you know, who knows? You, you don't know which way to go these days, really, because, you know, they complain about baby nappies. They should complain about all people's uh, pads, really. That is a bigger issue. So um, work areas, uh, you get a sterile zone, which is anything that is defined as sterile, like an operating room. You get a clean zone for storage of equipment and instruments. Um, uh, then you get a treatment zone. That might be in, like in, um, a room where all your um, uh, wound care things are kept. And then normally they have a chair in there. If somebody needs to go and get their injection or treatment, and that they are mobile, they can go into the treatment room. And uh, then you get contaminated zones, which can be your uh, your pan room or your sush room, there's different names people have for that, where we dispose of everything. So, and uh, identify these rooms and maintain them separately, keeping them clean separately. Record uh, materials and medication storage. So, records and material supplies are usually, um, uh, must all be stored in a clean, dry place, an hygienic uh, place that's also Clean. Most of the time these storerooms don't have any windows in so that it's also free from dust. Um, there you keep your hard copy records in few places like that, uh, lockable. Um, there will be supplies in there. Like sometimes yeah, you get like a storage room, but you also might get a linen room where all your linen is kept and that it looks like all your clean bedding and clean towels and all that. Obviously that needs to be kept clean. 
you are not going to take uh, go touch the clean linen with dirty hands and go take it to a different client's room, you know. So um, storage should be on shelves in dry, proper, organized storage spaces. Or oh, in the linen rooms can become such a mess because everyone goes in there and pull things off the shelves and it's always in a rush and yeah, let's keep it clean. Uh, confined contaminated instruments and equipment to well designed contaminated uh, uh, designed contaminated zones. So uh, equipment used for medical treatments like shafts, which would be injections um, or um, you know uh, the testing little um, triggers that you use for uh, testing people's blood sugar in the morning. Your wound care material, medication, ventilators, oxygen masks, urine testing equipment, little bottles that you test the urine in, because those bottles go to um, a pathology, pathology for testing, and it has it has to be sterile, so there's not other things in the little bottle when it's only the person's urine in there, so that they can get an accurate um, testing from it. Um, and then there's the refrigeration where once you've taken a urine sample, you'll bag it and seal it and put it in the fridge until the pathology comes and collects it. So that they, and you know, obviously um, your urine sample needs to be taken in uh, uh, with caution that it's not cross contaminated. You know, you can't send the urine sample away that sort of food. You can't take a urine sample from a big pan. You have to take the urine sample straight into the little container. Um, so you have to hold it underneath the patient so they can straight into the container, close it, and seal it up and put it in the fridge. And this is our last uh, little video. Such a cool Of being a
you couldn't do it without them. As an HSA in Southland, I find that I do make a difference. And it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, a nurse, anyone who works at the hospital. We're all family, and I think we all make a difference when it comes to a patient and how they do that. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Yeah, we are. You can go. I'm sorry. I have an appointment at 11. Actually, I was watching a nurse program the other day, and they were saying it's COVID.